Welcome to the Knowledge for Men show. Your life will never be the same. Your level of success will seldom exceed your level of personal development. I want to die empty of regret. I want to die empty of my best work. We don't understand who we are. Instead, we're living out somebody else's narrative. What one man can do, another man can do. If it's been done, it can be done again. Being yourself and being your truest, most authentic self in every moment. If it scares you or makes you a little afraid, do it. Follow your heart and your gut. The first stage. I think it's finding you, like finding out who I am today. Stuff will not work. You will have things that fail. Success is when you're a happy, fulfilled person. How do you define success? It's your life, and you are the creator of the movie script that is your life story. Hey guys, haven't shared it too many times, but one of the biggest epiphanies that I've ever had in my life was the first day that I started reading personal development, entrepreneurship, business books. And the day that I started reading those books, that was the day when my life changed. And ever since then, I've never stopped. So I've compiled the top 30 books and also the top 30 success quotes that every man must live by in a simple guide. You can download it for free at kfmfree.com. Again, that's kfmfree.com to really start growing in every aspect of your life. All right, guys, welcome to the show. I'm here with Mike Dillard. He's an entrepreneur, had his first million dollar business by age 27. He's an investor, author, freedom fighter, really interested in learning more about that. And I think most importantly, uh, father. Mike, happy to have you here on the show. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Been a fan of your work and excited to have you here. Now, we start off every show with a success quote or some sort of saying that's helped you along your journey. What do you got for us? And what does that mean to you? <sighs> oh, man. So... Honestly, I don't know if I have anything specific, you know, right off the top of my head. I, I don't know if I'm a huge quote guy, but man, I, mean, I just think one of the single most important lessons that I've learned throughout my career as an entrepreneur is you just never, never stop. You never give up. You never stop. When you get punched down to the ground or, or fall or whatever it may be, you just you get back up. And ultimately, that's really a requirement for every entrepreneur out there because that's going to happen to you on a very regular basis. So Now, do you keep trying and doing the same thing until it works or, or do you pivot and try something new? I'm just drawing to that whole quote by Albert Einstein. It's like, you can't keep doing the same thing and expect a different result. Yeah. Well, there's definitely some intelligent decision-making that needs to take place around that. When I first started as an entrepreneur back in college and in my early 20s, I was in the network marketing industry. And I probably joined 10 to 15 different companies over a six-year period. And I failed every single time. I didn't make money in any of them. So you were losing money because you got to pay money to join these. Sure. <laughs> yeah, ab- so absolutely. Okay. Yeah, it's not a lot of fun. So, you know, failing 12, 15 times, six years straight, one could have easily said, okay, you know, something's not working here. Maybe I, maybe I shouldn't be an entrepreneur. Thankfully, that is not the choice that I make. And, and, it, and I think that's the perfect example of you don't give up. But there does come a time when, okay, what I'm doing isn't working. Maybe I should try something a little bit different. And so that's finally what I did. I took a completely different approach to the industry. And that changed everything. And within 18 months, I made my first seven figures. So looking back, what do you think that you were doing wrong? And then what were like three steps that really helped you break through that, that threshold there? Sure. So the first thing that I realized that I was doing wrong is that I was looking for success to come from someplace outside of myself, yeah. specifically in the form of an opportunity. Yeah. You know, this opportunity or this product is somehow going to make me rich was, was faulty thinking, number one. Number two, you realize, okay, if success is going to come from me, and that's the only place it will ever come from, what makes other people successful? So what was the common thread between all of the individuals who were walking across the stage and actually making money and myself. And what I realized is that all of those individuals had at one point or another mastered a specific skill. Either they were a master at speaking from stage or holding an event or holding a teleconference or whatever it may be, they were one of the best of the best at that skill. And that skill is what allowed them to achieve their results. And up until that point in time, I had not mastered anything. Like, so I like decided of all to, trades kind of thing where you're pretty good at a couple of things, but not a master. No, no, because I had spent the last previous years waiting for the business or the product to make me rich. Right. So I had not been investing in my myself or my skill set. And so the next epiphany that I had was if I'm going to stay in this industry, 
I don't really enjoy the networking aspect. I'm not a people person. And years later, I would discover that, you know, I'm an INTP, which is a very introverted personality type. And so sticking someone with an INTP personality type into the network marketing industry was one of the worst things you could possibly do. There can't be another personality type that would be more of a worse fit than mine. So... I had to make a decision. If I'm going to stay in this industry, I have to pursue the business in a form or fashion that is aligned with my personality type and how I think and how I like to work. And so the end goal was that of that thinking was, if I'm going to stay in this industry, I don't want to have to call people or chase people or sell people. I want 10 to 20 people to contact me every day and I want them to be ready to buy my product or join my business. I don't want to have to convince them. I don't want to have to sell them. I want all of that done for me. And so I discovered that you can actually do that through the skill set of copywriting. You can write a script for a sales video or a letter that does all of that for you. And so that's what I did. I spent the next uh, year mastering the skill set of copywriting, buying every book and course that I could. I learned how to write a sales letter. And that is what absolutely changed everything for me. And all of a sudden now I could write ads and post them on Google AdWords and I could generate 100 leads a day without speaking to anyone. And out of those 100 leads, 10 of them would call me in the next day or two ready to to join the team or buy my product. And uh, so that was the the big transition piece. Yeah. It sounds like it became math for you after a certain point. It was like, I buy so many leads, so many will convert. And there you go. I can can just scale and, and spend more money online. Yeah. It turned into a real business. With the personality types, do you think that it's possible that someone can change? Because as people grow and experience more in life, that they start to discover more about themselves? I think there's a degree that you can change or there's there's definitely some flexibility there. From what I've seen around you know, Myers-Briggs specifically, it's a pretty hardwired pretty hardwired result. You know, after I read my personality, I was like, holy smokes, I was born with an instruction manual. I've been exactly like this my entire life. But obviously, there's some flexibility there. And what you have to realize when you get into personality types of any kind is that you cannot use it as an excuse. It's very easy. And I do see people who get their type and say, well, I'm this type, so I'll never be X, Y, or Z, or I'll never be able to do X, Y, or Z. And they use that as an excuse or justification for their lack of results instead of using it as a way to optimize their approach to get the results that they're after. So each one has its own benefits or strengths and weaknesses. But I think first having an awareness around which one you fall into and then and then leveraging that is the first step. Yeah, absolutely. It'll it'll help you pursue your business in a way that is aligned with your personality and your operating system frankly so that you're not pushing the ball uphill. And that's, you know, really step number one is get rid of all of the obstacles that are that are in your way at the moment. Yeah, this is good stuff. And guys can just Google Myers-Briggs personality test for more information on that. But coming back to yourself here, if you're failing at something multiple times and it's not working, what's driving you? Why didn't you just go and get a job somewhere? It seems like you had had some skill sets here that you could apply in other arenas. Why did you keep with entrepreneurship? Why are you so like, I'm not going to quit? Where does this come from? The thought of having to work for someone for the rest of my life was infinitely more painful than what you know my failure felt like. To so <laughs> pain, like the pain of a boss. Yeah, sure. It's just a, a level of determination that it really is at a core level for me. And I think for most successful entrepreneurs who, who make it, you're going to be tested along the way. You're going to have to grow. You're going to have to push yourself. You're going to have to learn new skills. And that just takes time, frankly. It takes three, four, five, six, seven years. And for me, it was either become an entrepreneur or die trying. And literally, I I don't (laughs) think that figuratively, I mean, I will literally do that. So, Okay. Yeah. And then you went on, you've carried this message along with like in the pursuit of financial freedom with a financial education company called the Elevation Group. Can you talk about the formation of this and, and what it does? Sure. All of the businesses that I've started have been inspired by a personal challenge or problem that I had and I could not find an appropriate solution for. And so in 2008, the market that, that's crashed. A big, that's a big lesson right there for all the listeners. <laughs> I yeah, think well, there's you a know. ton of uh, like your own challenges or opportunities not to be angry about, but to potentially help others with. Yeah. I think it just has to come from that kind of place because otherwise you're not going to be motivated to go out and build a solution. And fail you know, six if it's not a fail six times. <laughs> yeah. Go yeah, ahead. absolutely. So yeah, go ahead. Here. So my my first business in networking had done really, really well. It was a multiple eight figure business. And I turned 30 in 2008, right before the market crashed. And I realized that I'd 
spent every penny that I'd ever made doing really fun stuff in my 20s and buying cars and all kinds of, you know, really amazing things that everybody tends to put on their dream board. Right. And like external material items. Yeah, just, you know, experiencing all of the stuff that had motivated you uh, during the hard years. And so 30 came around and that was a big wake up call. The market crash was a big wake up call. And I realized that I needed to start saving money and, and building wealth. But after the market crashed, you know, nobody knew what worked anymore. Everything that people had done in the past, they just lost their shirts through. And so it left a big giant question mark or fill in the blank on, okay, how do you actually invest in a post 2008 world? And, you know, everything that I read at the bookstore or found online was traditionally meant or positioned for baby boomers who had jobs and who were interested in just simply growing or protecting their money at a, at a very reasonable rate and becoming upper middle class was kind of the end goal or result of that process. And that's not what I wanted. I wanted to become rich. And so the logic became, if you want to become rich, you have to invest like the rich actually invest. And there were no books or courses that I could find on that. So I decided that I would start a new business focused on this subject matter. And it would uh, ideally be you know, targeted to entrepreneurs because in the entrepreneur space, there's an endless you know, stream of sources of people and information and courses that will tell you how to make money, but nobody was talking about what to do with the money once you make it. And so the goal of the Elevation Group was to really answer that question and so it was basically a private diary and I hired a videographer and we would travel around the country and, and in our studio and interview individuals that I considered mentors when it came to money and building wealth or that I personally invested in and all kinds of different assets like apartment complexes and things like that. We sold access to that for $97 a month. It was wildly successful. We had 8,600 people join in the first seven days and uh, it was an eight-figure company in its first 12 months. So... That's incredible. <laughs> That's those are yeah. incredible results. I'm curious, just kind of to prelude before this, like if you already had the material items already, like you said, you had a lot of the fun things. So I'm assuming like nice place to live and car and experiences. What was driving you to build even more wealth when you had those things already? Well, no, I, I mean, I didn't. All I had was a bunch of fun toys and liabilities, <laughs> you know. So the money, there was no like, I had no savings, I had no stock account, I had no nothing. I had, I had uh, some nice, you know, Audi R8s and Aston Martins and a six-bedroom house and a boat. But you know, as far as building wealth goes, uh, that had not been a priority. You know, I was a single guy in my twenties and making seven figures a year, and you know, saving money and building wealth just hadn't been on my mind until that point in time. What's the difference between being rich and being wealth, and then also the mindsets? Being wealthy, I would say it's the ability or the option to no longer work if you don't want to. So for me, if you're rich or if you're wealthy, you have the option to work because you want to, because you're passionate about whatever you're doing, but you don't have to. All of your bills are covered. All of your assets are paid for. You've got cash flow coming in from uh, passive income streams like real estate. And you're just working because you want to work. And so for me, that's really the ultimate goal for myself and for, I would say, anyone else out there in the entrepreneurial space. And one of the biggest lessons that I learned and that I would share with the listeners today is yeah. that the skill sets that allow you to become a great entrepreneur are the exact opposite of what would allow you to build and accumulate wealth. Mm, that's big. Meaning, so, okay, go ahead. Yeah. So as entrepreneurs, we're successful and we are entrepreneurs because we're very comfortable and okay with taking risks and making fast decisions because right. that's what starting a business requires. Right. Now, if you apply those two characteristics to money and investing, they're a recipe for disaster. Making quick decisions and taking risks, great way to go broke. So that was a huge lesson learned for me. And what I eventually came to the conclusion of or really accepted as a, as a truth from one of my, my mentors during these years is that entrepreneurs get rich through their businesses. We have the ability to produce cash flow on demand through our companies. Our goal from an investment perspective is to not lose that money. So for the average person who has a job and that's in the middle class, it's the opposite. They're on a fixed income from their career and their only option to get rich or build wealth is through investments, through a lot of time and, and hopefully you know, by not losing any money. But they have to take risks putting their, their money in the stock market and things like that. Entrepreneurs, again, exact opposite. You want to get rich, generate a lot of cash flow focused on your business. That'll be the biggest ROI that you could ever possibly produce. And then just don't lose that money and you'll become wealthy. 
And so, <laughs> so what comes first, the entrepreneur or the investor? Which skill sets do you need first to build wealth? I mean, entrepreneur, I would say for sure. You've got to have the ability to, to generate that cash flow engine and produce cash flow so that you can accumulate capital and then uh, go deploy that capital into assets that are very, very low risk and that you, uh, you, know, you don't have to worry about on a daily, a weekly, or monthly basis like you do you know, with stocks or something like that. Top three investments that you'd recommend that are, that are that such, like long-term, low-risk investments? But foundational pieces for me, for sure, always having some percentage of your money in uh, physical gold and silver. I think that's just a, a very safe thing to do. It's off the books. It's not in a bank. People don't know about it. And it's just basically the equivalent of cash in your mattress. And it hedges risk from the outside world. Again, if your goal is to not lose your money, you don't have control over the financial system or the forex markets or the banks or anything like that. The only way to hedge against that is to have some physical gold and silver. So I think that's really step number one. Step number two has been a very unique strategy called infinite banking for me, which is a very specific way of using uh, whole life insurance. And essentially that acts like a savings account on steroids. And the characteristics that it has, which have been useful for me specifically, but entrepreneurs in general, is that you can automate payments to it. So every single month, money gets drafted out of my bank account and gets automatically put into this life insurance account and I never have to touch it. Instead of earning a tenth of 1% like a savings account would, it earns usually 5 to 7% per year. The nice part about it is that it's not exposed to the stock market in any way. So if the stock market crashes like it did in 08, you're not going to lose a dime you know, with the money that you have deployed in this type of account. And the other part is that you can take 100% of that money out of that account whenever you want if you decide that you want to retire at the age of 60, no matter what, you can take all of that money out of that account that has grown and accumulated 100% tax-free. And so that's uh, pretty nice as well. So for those reasons, that has been a very useful tool for me to build up cash and, and wealth. And then the third one would have to be cash flow real estate and apartment complexes specifically. Yeah. And I don't know the first thing about investing in real estate or apartment complexes. But I've tracked down two of the best firms in the world who happen to be the best of the best at that. So I just write them a check and invest in a few complexes. And that's averaged for me anywhere from 25 to 35% a year in return. So, Wow. Yeah, that's, that's really good if you're getting <laughs> those kind of returns. Now, I'm curious, why wouldn't someone want... If someone's already a successful entrepreneur, they have a great cash flow business, why wouldn't this... And then this person can replace himself. So he's not, he doesn't need to be in that business as much. He, maybe he's just spending maybe instead of 80% of his day, he's only spending 10% of his day and it's a successful business. Why wouldn't this guy just go on and create another business and use his same skill set there and just continue building this domino effect of building more cash flow businesses sure. and, and spending yeah. maybe five to seven years in each business and then you know getting someone with an MBA or something who's got a ton of experience who, who loves to be like a CEO to run the, the business and then and then just keep building businesses and then the businesses themselves could be sold in the future. Yeah, no, I mean, absolutely nothing wrong with that. But you're going to have to do something with the distributions you get from those businesses. Mm. So see, there's going to be a spillover when you've got a surplus of cash. And what do you do with that cash? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So this has been a good financial education uh, <laughs> episode so far here. I'm always interested in just building wealth and, and financial freedom to me. I used to work as a retail manager of a Target store and then having since built this this brand and have had more freedom and make a ton more than when I had a job. It's just I'm always interested in learning more about about wealth, not about making money, but like real wealth. And it's great to talk about that. But what I want to dive into now is so you you've been around so many powerful men in your life and with your own recent work with your podcast. What have you found really makes a great man? You know, I would say the one characteristic that pops into my head first that really separates the people that I look up to versus the people that I don't would yeah. be integrity. Integrity. And integrity would be the word. Who are the people that speak the truth and it's not coming from a place of ego? It's just they speak the truth, whether they're having a good time in life or some hard times in life, and who realize the wisdom behind doing that because circumstances change. But if you come to realize that somebody has integrity. That's an individual where you always know where you stand with them and where they stand with you. And that allows really cool things to happen, cool opportunities to come about. 
So, yeah, that would be the first word that pops in my head. Okay. Yeah, we'll continue on with a few more. But on this topic of integrity and speaking your truth, how do you find that balance where what if like you're just not doing good? Like, are you just always going to be that guy who's just walking around telling people that he's not doing good and he's bringing this negative energy or if he's sad, he's going to just tell people he's sad. Where do you find that balance between speaking your truth and and being this guy who's just uh, negative Nancy? (laughs) Well, when I say speaking your truth, I just mean overall, are you being real with people and, and honest with people? And I don't, so I don't mean that in like a, a niceties type of way where like, yeah, I'm having a shitty day when someone asks you how your day's going. But when it counts, when you're going into a business deal or making an agreement with someone, are you going to keep your word, do what you said you're going to do? Yeah. And if the deal falls apart, are you going to try and screw other people over to benefit yourself? Or are you going to take the hit so that the other people who were involved in the deal, you know, come out on the winning side and you'll take responsibility for whatever your role was in that. Right. So, yeah. So, I mean, as far as the, the negative Nancy stuff goes, that's just, I don't have people like that in my life. I, most, <laughs> most entrepreneurs don't because you won't get to this circle or into this circle in this club, if you will, uh, with that kind of attitude. I mean, those are, those are the people, frankly, who are, you know, shopping at Walmart and worried about discounts and, <laughs> Pinching pennies and it's a mindset. I mean, I realized this 10 years ago when I was first starting out is that thoughts are things and they're contagious just like any other kind of illness or sickness or whatever you have out there. And if you're hanging around people who have, you know, horrendous, unproductive mindsets, then that is going to rub off on you. And so people wonder why, you know, the the wealthy fence themselves into private neighborhoods and tall towers and cars with dark windows. It, it looks and, like a castle. Like they're defending, they have moats, they have like a guards. <laughs> they're, li- they're literally, they're defend- people don't understand that. They're literally defending and they don't maybe not on a conscious level, but on a subconscious level, defending their mindset and their exposure to things that could trip them up and people that could sabotage the success that they're having. And, you know, my form of that is just to ignore those people. The block button on Facebook and, you know, things like that. Twitter are definitely used on a regular basis in my world. So <laughs> I just I was at it's called O'Reilly's Auto Parts. I was buying some oil and uh the guy was talking about how he got a new job and I was like, oh what kind of job? And he's really happy. And he said he's gonna be a Wrigley gum tester where they're gonna send him sample gum and <laughs> he's gonna test it out. Hmm. And, and that was it. and he was like so happy and I'm like I just didn't get it. I'm like that that's your job. <laughs> and uh yeah, just yeah. I felt like I was I was becoming dumb. Like I was talking to this guy and I was just like, like, Oh my gosh, what is happening to my mind here? Just from a conversation with this guy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when I run into situations like that, the the one thing that pops into my head is gratitude, you know, gratitude that I was born with the brain that I have and the wisdom to pursue the path that I've pursued because it's a, a very, it's a very, very rare one. And very few people have the mindset or Gosh, I don't, I don't know if it's biology or whatever, but very few people are wired to be entrepreneurs. This is not something that everybody can pursue. In fact, I would say 80% of the world is not wired this way. But from some good stroke of good fortune, uh, we were. And so I am absolutely grateful for that. So on that topic right there, like you're saying like 80% of the world is wired for this. I think it might depend on, on what level of wealth you're talking about. I would say that more than most people, the majority of the world can build a six-figure business, but I would agree with the majority of the world could not build a seven or eight-figure business. But I think most people could... Just some simple things could, could get them to six figures. I think that they have the mental capacity to do that. I don't believe that they have the internal desire to do that. Yeah. Okay. Just I think they I, want. I know there's listeners who are like, "What? I can't be an entrepreneur." <laughs> and uh, well, I, I mean, the fact that they're listening to the show is a, probably a sign that that is within you know them to pursue it. Because the average person that is working in a corporate job in a building in a desk and driving their Honda or their Prius is not thinking about starting anything. They're thinking about keeping their job and where they're going to go for lunch today and what shows they're going to watch a TV tonight, you know, and that's 70, 80% of the population. So yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, <laughs> it is. It is interesting. And earlier you spoke about how you like went around and interviewed all these very, not rich people, but wealthy people. And when you were having these conversations, I'm sure you went into some of their stories. Did you find any commonalities in their upbringing 
Did you see anything similar that was like, oh, wow, like this is a common thing that I'm seeing amongst wealthy people? Usually it's that everybody, you know, at some point in their lives when they were first becoming an entrepreneur, entrepreneur came from a place of pain. Yeah. So bad upbringing, shitty parents, teased in school, whatever it may be, they were coming from a, a place of a very real dissatisfaction and pain in their lives. And they needed to create a way out of that. And, uh, you know, starting a business and kind of taking control of their lives and their destiny is typically how that is, you know, best done. So I would have to say that that's probably the single most common trait in all of the entrepreneurs that I've spoken with. And the other trait would, would be this incredible, you know, sense of determination where they have that inflection point where it's okay, this place sucks, it's very painful. Am I going to surrender to that? Or am I going to fight it and overcome it? And uh, and they've all got this level of determination and competitiveness that they're going to get out of that situation no matter what the cost is. And did they do it themselves or did they have a team around them? Well, in my experience, every entrepreneur starts with themselves. Nobody has a team in the beginning. You know, you're just trying to figure out what the hell you're doing. And to acquire a team or have a team around you requires, you know, some form of, of cash or revenue, which means you've gotten your business to at least some kind of of positive cash flow state, but every one of them, without a doubt, has sources of knowledge and inspiration. Meaning, we've all listened to Tony Robbins in our car and in our, you know, on iTunes, and still continue to this day reading books, you know, going to events and having lunch with mentors. You know, all of that is 100 percent required because you have to get the education and the skill set from somewhere. You know, there, this is not taught in schools, obviously. So it is uh, a pool of knowledge you have to actively pursue on your own. Yeah, it's painful that it's not in schools. (laughs) But uh, I I think there's some other reason why that why that's there. But what would you say are the daily habits that would make someone more successful in their life? You know, I've always said that I've built my businesses one brick at a time. And the way that I've managed my entire companies is with a very simple list of three to five things or priorities that I need to get done on a daily basis. So Mm -hmm. every night before to bed, what are the three to five things I need to get done the next day? So I wake up, I know exactly what I need to get done that day. And if I don't have that, I'll find myself getting sidetracked into all kinds of very unproductive tasks and distractions. And so those three to five things represent three to five bricks. And if I complete you know, all five of them, then great. I have laid five bricks into my future home. And if you're building a mansion you know, out of bricks three to five a day, it's going to take you probably three to five years to build that mansion, but it will actually happen. Yeah, I like that kind of analogy, just that that view of it. You're building your castle, you're building your future with bricks. And by just focusing on three to five, I, I think the way that most people would view someone who's successful is that he's doing 20 bricks a day. But you're doing three to five effective bricks that that are put in the right yeah. spot. You know, or that just magically for some unknown, mysterious reason, you woke up one day and you have a mansion. And it's just not like that is... It is the result of daily activities for three to five years and and making progress a little bit every single day over a long period of time. And then boom, magically, you know, you have the end result that you were after. But I found that's really the only way that people actually succeed at at anything that they they undertake. How do you keep going or get through that plateau when you keep laying bricks and, and you're not seeing results? Like you're not seeing that progress and you just feel like you're banging your head against the wall. Well, that's progress too. (laughs) <laughs> you know, uh, you know. I mean, right, doing, right. not not getting the results. Failure is a much more valuable source of knowledge and experience than winning will ever be. And so, during those six years of failure that I had in networking, well, I learned what didn't work and what I was not good at, which was extremely valuable because you're going to have to figure that out at some point. So you might as well just get it over with, right? And the sooner you do that by failing as often and as quickly as you can, the sooner you're going to eventually come across, you know, the knowledge or the skill set that actually clicks and works with you. So it's a necessary part of the process you just need to deal with. And like I said, at the very beginning of the show, just keep getting up and keep moving forward. Do you have a stoic view of life? (laughs) Not really. You know, I honestly had never even really heard of that word until, uh, until uh, Ryan holiday. I was just going to say Ryan holiday brought it to life. He's got a new book that can't comes out tomorrow. Uh, Ego is the enemy, which is a stoic book too. But yeah, it it seems like you're able to remove your emotions and just do what you need to do is what I'm getting from you. 
Yeah, and ironically, that's a part of my personality traits. So. <laughs> oh, like your disc profile or, or uh, yeah, Myers yeah, Briggs? okay, yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong; it was an unbelievably frustrating time in my life. You know, when I'm I'm living in a three hundred dollar a month apartment with nothing but a bed and uh, and a, my desk from college. Is, and this, a, uh, is this in Texas? That was actually in Temecula, California. Whoa, uh, that's where I'm from. Yeah, yeah. What, I lived uh, in, uh, what part of I went to Chaparral High School? <laughs> I don't know. It was it was this crappy apartment complex right across from a grocery store and a Taco Bell. Um, Taco Bell, Taco Bell. Is this? Uh, I think that was off like Winchester. But anyways, that, this is that's just between me and you. But yeah, I'm from Temecula, yeah. California. Why why would you be in Temecula if you're not? Unless you're. Uh, I up, would. Uh, yeah, I was going up. to. I was going to to work with a mentor of mine uh, a month after I graduated from college. So I packed up all my things and drove out to to San Diego and realized I couldn't afford anything in San Diego and so <laughs> yeah that's uh, what happens yeah, um, yeah so that's really I funny was. I was I grew up there for 18 years and uh, I have yet to yeah. really meet anyone from there so or who's been in that town yeah other yeah, than yeah. my high school friends but anyways coming back to this year what would you say is your you're obviously on this path you're building you know you're going to build a ton of wealth that you already are what's your number when do you stop my number is to get to a point where I have enough cash flow deployed in passive income assets like real estate that's producing a hundred thousand dollars a month in passive income that is not coming from one of my businesses. So, you know, if you look at what that would take, let's let's just round it to a million dollars a year in passive income. That's roughly eighty grand a month. Yeah. Close enough. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. So at a ten percent return, you need to have 10 million deployed that's producing an average of 10% return, which is pretty high with, with that amount of number. So realistically, you're actually probably going to look at 12 to $15 million yeah. actively producing a return to hit that number. So don't you want to reinvest though? So it grows and you, you make more. Next yeah. Year? Oh, and, that, and that's, and that's assuming that you're spending all of that, which would not be good either. So, you know, bare minimum though, to hit that number, it would take 12 to 15 million, you know, producing 10% a year. So wouldn't that be kind of tough to you're worth 15 million but you're living off like let's say you make a million but then you reinvest 500 so you're living off 500 and so the guy living next door to you makes 500 but you're worth like 15 you you know you live the same lifestyle but you're worth 15 million cuz you I'm talking about re, when you reinvest and you're you're putting your money away in in long-term assets like your money's there and uh you know you're living off of the returns well you're well you're assuming that you're not working or building another business, which is probably not going to be the case like I'll never just stop I'll never just stop I'll always be working on something else but you know for me that is a number to where you can go out and do anything you want live anywhere you want and not have to work if you don't want to which means you know you're really only working on the things that you're most passionate about and and you're there not because of the money because yeah it's what you want to do so to me that's really kind of the ultimate expression of freedom yeah and i i think what the big prize would be so yeah right now i'm really interested in like people's daily routines i find that through their daily routine i can see the habits that build to success so i did ask you like hey what are some three you just say you do 3 to 5 things i'm curious like uh, the last guy I interviewed, I'll, I asked him a similar question, and he says he wakes up at three. And I was like, "Whoa, I'm not, I'm not open to that." But I'm interested in when you wake up. I'm interested in like what your kind of just your routine sure. looks like, and yeah. uh, I can, I can, and the audience can replicate that. Well, it's interesting. I think that again, that comes down to your personality type. You know, I became an entrepreneur because I don't like being beholden to any kind of schedule, right. whether that's my own or or somebody else's. So I tend to rebel against any kind of. Uh, <laughs> any kind of routine or whatever, because that to me is just another form of giving myself a job. <laughs> so, all right. You know, so I mean, I, I tend to wake up when the sun wakes me up. So seven, seven thirty. So no alarm. You just, you just like, well, your eyes just open. Yeah. I, I get that's, up when that's freedom to me. That's freedom. Absolutely. To me. The alarm well, clock is evil. Yeah. Like when I hear it, I, I want to throw my phone out the window. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I, I feel the same way. So yeah. So then I, I grab breakfast or make breakfast and then um, do the whole shower thing and usually sit down at my computer, you know, 30, 45 minutes later, start going through email and I've got my three to five list. And I frankly, I just go to work until, you know, 1130 noon when it's lunchtime. I usually favor some food over from a healthy restaurant and have that delivered to the house so I can I can just kind of keep cranking. And um Usually go till about four o'clock, which is when my brain has had enough and, and it's just no longer really productive for me to continue to work. 
and either hit the gym at that point or not. Maybe read for 30 minutes to an hour and then go have dinner at five or six. I try to eat very early so that I can take advantage of kind of that intermittent fasting, you know, component that Tim talks a lot about as well. Tim? Uh, Tim Ferriss. Oh, Tim Ferriss. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So intermittent, intermittent fasting, okay. you know, how can you go yeah, yeah. 16 hours a day without eating? And so if you eat at five or six and you don't eat again until, you know, eight in the morning, that, that kind of checks that box. And the benefits of that? Just metabolism and, and fat burning okay. is ideally what that is for. And okay. that's very comfortable for me. It's not a, I'm not starving or anything like that. So that's pretty much it. But I would say that I, when I'm working, I'm super productive. I'll work seven days a week sometimes. If I have stuff to get done, I just get it done. Like, you know, yesterday was uh, was a Sunday. I worked all day yesterday writing scripts and recording videos, you know, that I needed to get out to my customers today. So, yeah, I mean, that's uh, that's pretty much it. There's nothing sexy or magical or, or anything about, about my routine other than trying to eat healthy, get a lot of sleep, and get as much work done as I possibly can. And that's pretty much it. It sounds like you don't have an office. It's not, I mean, it sounds like you're in you're in your house. Is what I'm yeah, saying. yeah. No, I have I have a desk with a beautiful view overlooking uh, Lake Austin and downtown Austin, and that's pretty much it. Yeah, I think that's what I find so interesting is that the routines are pretty pretty simple. <laughs> like it's just, and that is the routine. Like the routine is simple, but done consistently over time leads to really good results. Yeah, you know, when I was younger, you know, in my 20s, I I would be much more disciplined and much more hungry about building my business and routines and fitness and all of that other stuff, but you know, 38 now in entrepreneur years, it's like dog years. You're you're kind of, you know, in your 50s or 60s in some in some circumstances. <laughs> yeah. But in wealth though, I mean, uh most guys when they're building wealth, they're getting into that age, 30s, 40s, 50s. Yeah, no, it's more from an energy and stress management where uh, where yeah. results and money and production are no longer primary; they're secondary to health and yeah. general well being. So, how do you balance living? You know, thirty eight years old, you've been grinding and hustling for quite some time here. How do you find the balance, or what advice do you want to give to some of the guys who want to have a social life as well? And I feel like there's a sacrifice that people think they have to make, and I'm wondering what's your viewpoint of that. You have to. If you want atypical results, you have to have an atypical work ethic and, and passion. When I was first building my first successful company, I didn't take a single day off for three or four years, you know, vacations or anything. I was just seven days a week working and I loved what I did. So it didn't feel like work and I was having a blast and I was making money. So, you know, I did that by choice. But that is what allowed me to build one of the biggest, you know, businesses in my niche. And so, that's required. You know, I, you can do a lifestyle business, but you're never going to build anything remarkable if you just want to pay your bills and, and have free time and, and do the lifestyle thing. It's totally fine, but you're never going to build an empire, you know, or, or do something remarkable with that kind of work ethic. So, you know, my advice for people would be to put in that time and effort and work like you've never worked before for the next three to five years of your life. Be very, very smart with what you do with the money that you make, you know, rather than, than spending on liabilities and things like that. And then you can be done. So, that, you know, that really is kind of the, my two cents on, on that one. What are the most common mistakes that prevent someone from being able to build wealth or transition from one like, all right, I got a cash flow business that's working what are some of the most common mistakes that would prevent someone from being able to transition into building wealth? You know, I, again, I think it, it comes back to put to that risk taking personality type. Yeah. You know, one of the traps that entrepreneurs easily fall into is, you know, getting wind of the next big, you know, venture investment or stock or whatever it may be where we are wired to look for and recognize opportunities and strategic decisions and things like that. And, and once again, doing that in a investment perspective where you do not have a lot of education, you end up paying what I like to call the stupid tax. And so the stupid <laughs> tax is, is the price that you pay for frankly being ignorant when it comes to a particular subject matter. And if you focus 99% of your time learning how to grow and build a business and make money and you spend 1% learning what to do when it comes to investing that money, you're going to pay a huge stupid tax. But the only way that you can really avoid that is to obviously start to change the amount of time in that ratio so that you sp start to spend more time educating yourself on money. When you do make investments and make decisions like that, make them very, very small. Don't throw 100 grand, 200 grand, 300 grand into an investment for you know the first time or two. Do 25 grand, do 50 grand tops and do that 
and five to 10 different investments and see what you learn because most of them are probably not going to turn out that great. And then second, the only other way to avoid the stupid tax is to invest with people who have spent their entire lives learning how to make money in that particular asset class like real estate so that you can take advantage of their knowledge and really leverage that as if it were your own. Yeah. Yeah. I'm seeing that uh, the, the stupid tax is the penalty for not working with the right people, it sounds like, or, or not. It's like just doing the same thing over and over again and not looking to expand and grow. Yeah. You're going to pay the stupid tax one way or another. You're either going to pay for it in the form of pursuing an education and time and money, say in reading books or taking courses. Time is very, very valuable. So you're going to pay it in that manner or you're going to pay it in the form of losses because you took uh, took risks that you shouldn't have. Yeah. What's your opinion on on getting an MBA as an entrepreneur? As an entrepreneur, dumbest thing you could possibly ever do. You know, if you want to be an architect or doctor or something like that, and you need an MBA for those fields, then obviously you need that. That's fantastic. I think pursuing an MBA, maybe, maybe to be, you know, in a management position, I'm on the fence about, I don't really, I don't really give a damn where you went to school or what degree you have. Can you get the job done better than I can get it done myself or, you know, any of the other candidates? And that's really all that matters to me is experience. I don't care what classes you went to or tests you took. I want to know what you have actually done in the real world. And so for me, I, especially if you're going to go into debt in the form of student loans, I think that's, that is just a horrendously, a horrendously bad decision making. All right. Getting a ton of financial advice here with Mike Dillard. And now I want to dive into the knowledge round. Just going to ask you a few more questions here. So Mike, ready for the knowledge round? You got it. All right, Mike. If you want to grow to the highest levels that you've ever been at in your life, go to kfm3.com and you can download the top 30 books and success quotes that every man must live by. Every guy should read. If you want to grow, if you want to achieve greatness in life, you're going to have to read and surround yourself with the greatest minds of the world. So I've done all of the hard work for you. I've read hundreds of books. I've listened to hundreds of audiobooks. I've gone through and found the best quotes that you'll need to succeed and thrive and grow and become the man that you want to be. So go to kfmfree.com and I'll send it to you right now kfmfree.com Welcome to the Knowledge Round where the guests will be asked rapid fire questions to give the audience invaluable pieces of wisdom to help transform their lives starting in 3, 2, 1 showtime What advice would you give to someone who's feeling lost or unsure of their purpose like they don't have a sense of direction of what they should work on like they want to build a business but they don't know where they should build that business like where should they plant their seeds go get a problem <laughs> a person who who's in that position doesn't have a lot of problems or pain in their life because if they did that would be a very big source of inspiration for them to go solve that problem you know people who are overweight and unhealthy tend to focus on and, and notice that fact and focus on it especially when they start to get sick you know or have a heart attack or whatever it may be and and that typically turns into a source of inspiration to change their lives and take control of their health and fitness. Once they do that, they've acquired a set of knowledge and skill set that automatically becomes very valuable to a large audience of other people who would like to do the same thing. And before you know it, they've written an ebook or a course on how to, you know, eat better or become healthy or work out or whatever it may be. And so, you know, for people who are like, I just lost, I don't know what to do with my life go do something fucked up or like get a problem for yourself where, you know, you can get some form of pain that will inspire you to get off your butt and go solve this problem for yourself and for other people. Yeah. Start solving problems or look for problems, have an, have an awareness around problems. And those are, look at, look at yourself too. Like, where am I not satisfied? What am I not satisfied, you know, in my life in a particular area? And if you can't come up with an answer to that, I don't really think you're meant to be an entrepreneur. All right, we'll leave it there. There has to be yeah. there has to be a form of hunger, you know, a source of hunger in there. And I don't think any entrepreneur I've ever met has been like, you know, I've been completely satisfied my whole life. It's just not a part of our DNA. Yeah. And what would you say was holding you back, Mike, from becoming the man you are now today? You know, obviously it did nothing held me back, but what I would have done differently in retrospect is I would have gotten over my fears sooner. You know, during those six years of struggle, I had a very big fear of selling and just of, of, you know, talking to people on the phone or selling in general. You know, being an introvert, that's just a very uncomfortable situation for me. 
but it's something you have to get over. If you're going to be an entrepreneur, you have to sell. And so you have to get over that fear. And I wish I would have done that in, you know, one to two years instead of five or six years. So, you know, if you want to get a particular result, you have to become a person who is capable of achieving that result. And you know, you, with a little retrospection, what is holding you back, what those excuses are, what your weaknesses are. And you're just going to have to face them. You know you are. So you might as well get it over with now instead of wasting five years. Okay, I like that. I'm wondering, what did having a kid do to you as a man and entrepreneur? What came into your mind when you're like, wow, I have a kid? How did that change things? You know, interestingly enough, not really a lot. You know, I, I think I'm very much the same person that I was then as I am now. You know, you've got another person that you're responsible for and you know, he's five at the moment. And so up until now, there's not a lot that I can teach him or talk to him about just because, you know, the kid's five. He's, <laughs> you know, into Scooby-Doo and playing and playing outside and riding his bike. So I think specifically entrepreneurs and the kind of knowledge that I've accumulated throughout my life that will be of value to him will start to come into play, you know, as he approaches seven, eight, nine, ten. And so at that point, you can really focus on becoming, you know, basically a mentor, you know, to him along with being a father. And so I think that will be a lot of fun and something that I'm looking forward to. But, you know, up until now, what I found is that, uh, you know, specifically for little boys, you know, the dad is kind of the sideshow and they're all about mom, you know, at one, two, three, four, five. So, yeah. <laughs> Do you feel left out? Do you want to talk about this here? Um, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this, no, this, it's just, the time? You know, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, I've just watching other kids raise their kids and reading books on the subject matter. It's, uh, that's where the focus is. And then they start to hit that second phase and the focus turns to dad and, yeah. and more it's masculine like activities. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Got it. Okay. What would you say have been three of your most influential books that have helped you on your journey? You know, it wasn't a book at the time, but it was a course and it is now a book. What's that? Product launch formula. Okay by Jeff Walker was, uh, you know, that original course I bought whenever it came out years and years and years ago, that, that has made me tens of millions of dollars. So that is without a doubt, uh, the best money I've ever spent on a book or a course and rich dad, poor dad would be the yeah. second as well. Definitely a classic. Yeah. Robert. And the third, I don't have a specific title, but it would definitely have to do with something along the lines of copywriting, maybe something like Dan Kennedy's, uh, the ultimate sales letter. Something along the lines of copywriting in that particular skill set was a, a huge game changer for me. Yeah. What I get from you is sales. Like even just from like you, you, you got to sell. You got to learn how to sell to... Can't do anything. It, it's, it's the light. Like because there's yeah. so much you could do in your business with like culture and team and okay meetings and productivity, you know, taking care of customers and all of that is important. But none of that I believe can happen until you make a sale. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed, agreed. That's, gotta, that is what changes everything. We got to learn sales. <laughs> All right. And now imagine if you had 60 seconds with 25-year-old Mike. If you can picture where he's at personally, professionally, maybe even romantically, what would you tell him to do? What would you tell him not to do? You know, I wish I had the financial education that I have now back then because I would have made some very different decisions with the money that I've made. So would you tell him to like read books or what would you tell him to do? Uh, read books so that you can make better decisions when it comes to money. You know, I think that would be priority number one. Number two, be very careful with the people that you get into relationships with. You know, maybe that's a girlfriend or a wife or whatever it may be. That's really the second biggest factor that will have an impact on your life, either in a positive way or a negative one. What would you look out for? Like values or what? Yeah, values and don't rush into anything. You know, take your time. Nobody's on a schedule and you know, just be very smart about the decisions that you make because the consequences to that can last a lifetime. So, so you're saying wear a condom. <laughs> is, that what, is that what you're trying to say? Yeah, well, you know, just again, it's that comfort with taking risks and making fast decisions that are great for business, but detrimental mm -hmm. in other areas of life. I see. I see. Yeah. So I see. Yeah. Got it. Got it. And so we're coming to a conclusion here. What would you say is the first thing for the audience to do once we end here, like if they did this, then yeah. they, they got like, this was worth your time. Cause there's a lot of people sure. listening to this right now. You know, whenever somebody asks me, Mike, how do you become successful or what should I do? Uh -huh. 
the ticket to that and the truth that that I discovered the hard way is that you have to master a skill set. Mm. Doesn't matter what it is, but the way that you increase your lot in life is by increasing your value to other people and to the world. Mm. And, you know, so that begs the question, well, how do you increase your value to others? That is by acquiring valuable skill sets. And so until you become one of the best in the world at something, you don't have a vehicle that can uh, let you really accomplish anything or deliver value to others, which means you're not going to do anything. You're just going to kind of sit there and twiddle your thumbs and wonder why the hell nothing works. So if you're stuck, if you've been in that position where it's like I keep trying and reading these books and blah, 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 and nothing's happening. Yeah. It's because you have not mastered a skill set that will allow you to make things happen on your own terms. So that was really the key that changed my life when I acquired the skill set of copywriting that empowered me to then go sell my products and other people's products you know, effectively. And so I could produce results on my own terms. I was not waiting from some outside force from a product or a business or a mentor to somehow magically you know, bring me results. I could create those results for myself. So... You know, that would be number one. And if you're going to learn a skill set, I would learn a skill set that is aligned with your personality type. So if you had told me that I need to go learn, uh, you know, SEO or coding or analytics of some kind that had to do with charts, numbers, graphs, or engineering, I would suck. I would absolutely suck at that and I would hate it and I would be miserable. So even though those are valuable skill sets, it's not aligned with my personality type. So figure out what is. For me, it happened to be writing. I love to write. I love picking up on patterns and pattern recognition, which is really valuable when it comes to writing sales copy, where you can pick out the patterns within a sales message and see the commonalities between all of them and kind of have a, an understanding of how this process works. And so that was a natural fit for me and, and that worked out well. And so within that skill set, whatever it may be, if you're in the engineering type, maybe it's generating traffic. If you can go out and teach yourself how to advertise on Facebook and then start to run and manage campaigns for other entrepreneurs like me who hate you know, running traffic and things like that, then that's a huge opportunity. You can instantly go out and build a seven-figure business within the next 12 months. But you have to master that skill set of how to advertise effectively on Facebook. So that really is the key to opening every door in the world out there is dedicating yourself to one particular skill, spend the next two, three, four, five years mastering that skill, becoming one of the best in the world at it so that you can write a book on it, write a course on it, whatever it may be. You're getting invited to speak on stage at events around that subject matter. And uh, when you hit that point, it's basically impossible not to have a seven-figure business. You'd, you'd have to attempt to not to in order to do that. Does it need to be your passion? What should someone pick? You have to have a genuine interest in it. You have to be super into that subject matter or you're not going to pursue it. It's not gonna, you're not going to wake up and work 12, 14 hours a day, seven days a week if you're not super excited about what you're doing. <laughs> so yeah, it has to be a skill set that you're interested in. You're like, man, I am super into this. I love this. All I want to do is read books about this and watch videos on it and work on this until two o'clock in the morning on my computer. And yeah, absolutely. That has to be there. Yeah. All right. I think that that answers that. And that's great. Thank you so much for sharing that. I think that gave a ton of us a lot of clarity in moving forward and what we should start doing immediately and, and really start getting on with this whole financial freedom and building wealth. This is great. I'm uh, really excited to have had you here on the show. And I'm just curious, before I let you go here, what are you most excited about in, in the next uh, like six months or so? Like, What's getting you out of bed in the morning right now? Yeah. So my biggest passion for the last two years has been the organic food world. So I have been working on a product to a... Uh, it's basically a solution to a problem of how do you put clean organic food back on the plates of everyday Americans, even if they can't afford to shop at Whole Foods? You know, one of the things about becoming a parent is that you become very aware of the food that you're feeding your children. And most people don't understand this, but the average bunch of spinach from a conventional grocery store or a restaurant or wherever it may be, or conventionally grown vegetables, have 54 different pesticide residues on it. And you eat that, you know, over the course of decades, it's just poison. You're just poisoning yourself and your family. And I think it's pretty disgusting that in order to eat clean food without poison on it, you have to be fairly wealthy. And that to me is just, it's a, a very disgusting thing to think about. So, you know, my, the last two years of my life, that's become my biggest 
uh, mission and, and passion project is coming up with a solution that will allow people to eat clean food without f- poison on it and to do so you know, at a price that's 70, 80, 90% less than what they would have to pay for it at their grocery store. And so we're launching a, a pretty revolutionary new product here in the beginning of 2017 that uh, I think will change the world and, and uh, how people grow their food and solve a lot of problems when it comes to the agricultural industry. I feel like it's like a self-made growing kit in in their front yard or something. <laughs> That's uh, it I is feel a like. well, I'll describe it for okay. you. It's right. a fully automated system that looks like a product Apple would design for your kitchen. Okay. That will grow 36 plants at a time, any kind of vegetables, herbs or flowers that you want. And uh, it's automated. It has Wi-Fi and sensors and electronics. And so all you do is is add the seeds and the thing runs itself. And it essentially will grow four to five grand a year in organic food for about four or five hundred bucks a year in run cost. <laughs> all right. Is that a Kickstarter thing that you're doing? No. You know, we'll sell it probably for pre-order in March. But I mean, it's already fully developed and we've been growing produce with it for the last three months. And, and you're eating it. You're eating out of it. Yeah, I mean it's it's the highest quality food you could possibly eat. <laughs> so and, and just to uh, for all the listeners here, like even just if we're to look back and listen to this whole show again, and then you were to listen to this point right here, Mike identified a massive problem that you know the whole world could use, and you're going to solve it. You're attempting to solve a massive problem, and that's kind of what you've been talking about here this whole time is is just you know looking for problems and and go and solve that problem with, with the skills that you have. Yeah. That is it. And you're living your message. Yeah. And if I did not have the ability to sell, you know, I could develop this product and spend a couple million bucks producing the prototype or whatever. But if I didn't have the ability and the skill set to sell it, then it was all for nothing anyway. So it always comes back to that skill set for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'm Mike, I'm glad that we, we had a conversation here. Looking forward to uh, getting an update from you in, maybe in the next year or so and uh, continuing to build a relationship with you. But uh, for all the listeners, Go to, you can just Google Mike Dillard, everything pops up. His website, his podcast, all his social media. But uh, MikeDillard.com, that's the easiest one that you can just check out. And then you can just Google his name, everything pops up there for you. And uh, Mike, thank you so much for being on the show and sharing a wealth, literally a wealth of information here with my people. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me, Andrew. And best of luck uh, with the show. And thank you to your audience for listening. And yeah, looking forward to doing cool, awesome things in the future and, and wish you the best. All right. Thank you for listening to the Knowledge for Men podcast. Hundreds of interviews and millions of downloads later, we're continuing to build an international movement and we're just getting started. So if you enjoyed this episode, go ahead and leave a helpful review in iTunes because it really helps the podcast grow so we can impact even more men in the world who need this. Guys, this is all about living with purpose, where every day you only do things that matter to you. You wake up, live with purpose, and take massive action towards the life you want. And always remember, love the life you have while creating the life of your dreams. Go to kfmfree.com to get a surprise bonus I've made for my listeners. Again, that's kfmfree.com for something that's changed my life and I'm offering it to you for free. Also, check out my Amazon best-selling books that I've written for you to help you crush life at kfmauthor.com. Again, that's kfmauthor.com to see all the books I've created to help you break through in life. This is your host, Andrew Farabee, founder of knowledgeformen.com, and I'll see you in the next episode. Episode.